the key relationship in the battery reaction here is to relate my number of moles to the conversion through that equation. If we go back to our mole balance, we ended off with this equation here, dMa by dt is equal to the reaction rate of A created, so Ra generated, times B. That was the key equation, the design equation from the bachelor's slide. So in the, if you go back three or four classes, we, we derived that equation. What were the assumptions there? In getting to that reaction, to, in getting to that equation. Well mixed. Well mixed, constant volume. Anything else? Not at steady state. Okay, so this, this was derived using those assumptions. Well mixed, constant volume, and not at steady state. In fact, this system up here, this equation right now, does in fact not assume. <laughs> we did not assume a constant volume assumption in this particular equation here. This V, V is a function of time, so then I would need to just account for it in the integral. Okay, so DNA by dt is RAV. Here V can change. I'm not necessarily assuming constant volume. If V usually stays the same, especially for liquid systems, but for batch systems, if V was a function of time, I could make that explicit by writing DNA by dt is equal to RA times V as a function of time. But then I would have to know how V changes over time, so I can take care of that when I do the integration. So, so this is the equation for batch. Now what I do is I can substitute that expression that I had for NA as a function of conversion. So NA as a function of conversion is up here. So if I were to sub in for that, I can take the derivative of dNA, and that is equal to Na0 minus Na0 times x, the derivative of that. I'm just take, I'm doing every single step so that we play here. The derivative of a constant is 0, and that's equal to minus Na0 dx. So we're comfortable with this from our math courses. So DNA can be, be replaced with minus NA0 times DX. That's what the equation is. Okay. The right hand side is the same. And then there's this third line is just taking the negative over to the other side. Okay. So what I've done here is going from this first equation to this third equation is this is where we started off with, where we're working in terms of number of moles. Now I'm working in terms of conversion, and that's where we're going with the CGM section. Let's, let's re-express our design equations instead of in concentrations and instead of number of moles, let's express it in terms of conversion. You're going to see why we're heading there in the example later on. Okay, so a very simple replacement in, in that derivative term. We can integrate this expression here as well. So take it by dt, so one side v dx on the other. Na0 comes out of the integral. It's the total number of moles I've added to my batch reactor at the beginning. So Na0 was charged to my batch reactor initially. That was the number of moles I added. So that's a fixed constant and it's known. We're going to integrate them between the limits from 0 to x. That's the total time. So at time zero, I've got zero conversion. At the final time t, I've got capital X conversion. Yes? Um, that equation, where does the first n is zero? The derivative of the constant is zero. Okay. So this, the integral here that we clear, we're going to integrate between initial time zero and final time t. At final time t, there's a certain conversion x in the batch. So this is a great way to design a batch reactor. Remember for a batch reactor, our design variable is time. How long? So this is telling me how long I need to run that batch reactor to achieve a certain conversion x. Here's a little bit of a problem. That x is in the integral in, as the upper limit. Okay, so 
I need to work iteratively. Either I give x and I can calculate t, or if I can run the batch process in t, I need to back calculate with x. Here. So you can run it both, work both ways. Notice we're leaving everything else inside the integral. Ra stays inside the integral. B stays inside the integral. If we don't simplify those out, you get to this. You can put it either way. So it depends if, if you know it. If you know volume is going to be um, changing with time, you can take it out to the dt side. If you know volume as a function of conversion, you're going to take it leave it in the conversion side. Which one are we more likely to know? <coughs> volume is a function of conversion, so we would prefer to leave it in the conversion side. So batch, that's our equation for batch systems. Now let's take a look at flow systems. Flow systems are all the other types of reactors, PFRs, CSTRs, PDRs. And we're starting off with a general equation that applies to all flow systems. So let's, uh, here I've got a draw picture here, let's take a look at what I just want to emphasize with flow systems. So whether we're dealing with a CSTR, or a PFR, both of these systems have a certain inlet mode of flow rate, FA0. Coming into the reactor. Both of these systems have an outlet flow, FA. At the inlet, if I my material at the inlet, I can consider that fact that conversion at this particular point in the pipe is zero. It's not reacting with anything yet. So at that moment, x is zero. Leaving the reactor, I have a certain conversion x. So the material reacts away in the reactor. Maybe there's some catalyst in here, something that's changing so that this reaction starts to occur. And leaving at the end, exit of the CSTR is a capital X conversion related to FA, the molar flow. Mm -hmm. what, the question we're trying to answer here with this derivation on the slide is how can we relate FA to X? Another variable we know here is CA, concentration. Let's, let's take a look at the PFR for a minute. The PFR, we've got our inlet flow, molar flow, FA0. Right at this entry point, at that entry point, x is zero. There's no conversion occurring yet. Let's assume, for example, this might be a PBR. This equation will apply to a PFR or a PBR. It only sees the catalyst right at the entrance, so only at that point is where it will start to react. Up until that point, conversion is zero. PBR, perhaps there's some conditions in the reactor that creates the reaction or allow the reaction to to initiate. Either way, right at the beginning of the reactor for a PDR and a PFR, conversion is zero. We progress along the reactor, leaving here is a certain conversion capital X. Grade, obviously greater than zero. And as I proceed through the reactor, X gets larger and larger. Okay, so for both these systems, both for CSTRs and for PBRs, PFRs, the same flow equation is going to apply. We're going to derive it simply saying our conversion recall again is defined as the number of moles reacted. So what's leaving, uh, oh, what's left over, we, um, we, can, we can calculate that and then that calculates how many moles reacted divided by the number of moles we, we fed to the beginning of the reaction system. Multiply that by the number of moles fed per unit time. So that product Fa0 multiplied by x gets me um, moles of A reactive. So the reason why I want moles of A reactive is because I'm going to bring it down here. I'm going to calculate what I put in, Fa0 minus what reacted, Fa0 multiplied by x. And that difference then is essentially what's leaving the system Fa. So Fa leaving is What's in minus what was consumed is what's going to end up leaving the reactor. 
I can simplify that and write it as FA is FA0, 1 minus X. Very similar to the batch, the batch equation here. So let's, uh, let's make this key, key observation that batch systems and flow systems, we have similar looking expressions, but in terms of the variables that matter for the respective reactors. So for batch reactors, what matters is the moles remaining inside the system the moles that were consumed in NA. For flow systems, it's the flow that matters. How fast and how slow this material is leaving. So there the relationship is FA is FA0 1 minus X. Similar expressions but in terms of the variable that you didn't count for the individual reactors. <coughs> So let's apply that to the CSTR design equation. In the previous class, we ended off with the expression based on the mole balance that V is the inlet flow minus the outlet flow divided by the rate of consumption. Key assumptions made in this derivation. I can't hear you. Well mixed. Well mixed, yes. Steady state. And well mixed and steady state, does that imply the volume is constant? Steady state, constant volume, the system remains the same over time. That's why we've got a capital V out here. Constant volume, we're going to calculate a single V. Single V that we're calculating then is related to the molar flow in minus out divided by the rate of at which we're consuming that species A. So summing in my new, uh, my new uh, calculation up here that the molar flow leaving in terms of the conversion and substitute that in with FA0 terms up here cancel out and then I'm left with FA0 multiplied by conversion divided by reaction rate. Is the rate constant? We had a bit of this discussion last night, but it's good that it's coming up again. I wanted to recap this anyway. Is the rate constant minus R A? Yes. Why? Oh, because it's the exit conditions. The exit conditions from the reactor, everything inside the reactor is at steady state. Minus RA here is the rate at which the system is reacting based on the in internals of the reactor conditions. It's then, because of the CSTR assumption, the same conditions that we're measuring at the exit. Okay, so minus RA, we substitute in the, the values for RA as they are as they're occurring inside the tank. So whatever Whatever's going on inside this tank, there's a certain concentration, perhaps, that you can measure. That CA then is going to uh, change what R, uh, you can define R in terms of CA substitute value. But it's a constant number that stays fixed in the reactor. So here, we've got the design expression for a CSTR for the variable that we want to know, volume, in terms of the other two, uh, the other three important variables, inlet flow, conversion and rate. So right, this, this equation is, is the key equation. Rate of consumption in the denominator, molar flow in the numerator, and, and conversion in the numerator. Very, very easy, great equation to work with. Just an algebraic equation. No integrals, no derivatives. Okay. We're going to work with this equation tonight. It looks deceptively simple, but we have to understand it. We're going to get, get to it in a minute. Let's take a look at the PFR now. Plug flow reactor. Here things are changing across the length of the reactor. So recall, we were discussing this last night, my coordinate system is in terms of volume, which is 
at the initial point V is equal to zero, at the final point V is equal to capital V. So it's no surprise that the design equation for PFR is a function of where you are along the reactor, VV. So the further and further I move along the reactor, the more and more things change. DFA by UV is equal to the rate of, of generation of RA. So please notice here, this is plus RA, rate of generation of okay. I can sub in here that FA is FA0 times 1 minus the conversion. Same idea here as before, let's uh, just work through that to be explicit. I can take the derivative of FA is equal to EFA0 plus the derivative of FA0 minus FA0 times X, which is equal to 0 minus FA0 dx. So just using those rules from, from calculus that we're comfortable with. So DFA is equal to minus FA0 dx. Sub in that over here. And I simplify that expression then to get the third equation that shows FA0 dx dv is equal to the rate of consumption now of RA. So I get my negative RA back. We're comfortable and we prefer dealing with minus RAs. So actually that negative that we get from the derivative um, of that expression over there is, is quite helpful. But I can't work with this equation. I can't design systems in terms of a derivative function. So let me integrate that between sensible limits. The sensible limits are, of course, the entry and the exit points from the reactor. So between 0 and the entrance in capital V. That relates to conversion at 0 at the entrance and capital X at the exit. So those, that's why I covered that here. At the initial point of my reactor, X is 0. At the final point, X is equal to X. So that those become the natural limits of integration. Can I pull the minus RA that's in the denominator out of the integral? No. no. It's changing as a function along the reactor length. Okay, so once again, as with the CSTR and with the PFR, we've got the inverse of the rate in the, oh, sorry, I should say we've got the, the rate expression in the denominator. I'm emphasizing that because that's where we're going next with this. So take a note, just look at that, what I mean by that. Here, the thing that matters for a, for a PFR is volume, but it's a function of the rate is expression, that rate expression is in the denominator. Let's go back to the CSTR equation. Function of volume, the rate is in the denominator. So let me just write that up here so we've got it for <coughs> So we don't need to come back to the slide every, every so often. So V is equal to FA0 times X over minus RA. That's the expression for a CSTR for a PFR. V is equal to FA0, the integral from 0 to x of 1 over minus RA dx. Okay, so we can do the same idea for PBR where we integrate relative to catalyst. Now, um, in your notes, I had this, uh, this, uh, this next slide. The title was incorrect. So what the correct title should have been is let's apply this now to a first order system. And we're going to look at expressing the first order reaction rate in terms of conversion. I won't uh, do this on the board, it's here up for So the rate expression minus RA is KCH for the first order system. We have that FA is equal to FA0 times 1 minus X. So this is for a flow system. We're not, I'm not going to deal with a batch example. This is for a flow example. So FA is FA0 1 minus the conversion. Let's take this expression and divide both sides by Q, the volumetric flow rate 
entering my PFR, so here's a certain volumetric flow rate entering Q0, leaving is Q. This is in general, so Q0 doesn't always equal Q, especially for gas-based systems. Q0 coming in, leaving is Q. So divide the left and the right hand side, remember this expression works for all CSTRs, all PFRs, all PDRs, so we're deriving this for all of them. Divide by Q, FA over Q is equal to my, convert, uh, my concentration. Molar flow per unit time divided by uh, volumetric flow, you can show there that that's equal to CA. FA0 divided by Q, that's not CA0. In general, that's not CA0. But if we make the assumption that Q is Q0, I can then write Q0 over there and express that as CA is CA0 times 1 minus conversion. But only under the conditions where Q is Q0 which are conditions where you have a reaction that does not lead to increase in volume over time. Okay, so in general that's for liquid phase systems or for gas phase systems where there's no increase in volume or pressure over, over, over time. So CA is CA0 for times 1 minus x for such systems. Let's substitute that into my rate expression. Minus RA is KCA. Now I have CA down here in terms of conversion, 1 minus x. So I get minus RA is KCA, or minus RA is CA0 times 1 minus x. So that's, where, that's my starting point here. Minus RA <coughs> is K times CA0 times 1 minus x. We like this expression. K is constant. CA0 is a known constant value. It's the number of, or the concentration I'm coming into my PBR with. It's the concentration I'm coming into my CSTR with. I know this from my laboratory data. CA0 I know from, from the raw material I'm using. So now I've got a, a, a way that I can compute my rate as a function of conversion. So everything we've done up to now, we're just switching over to new a new uh, variable, capital X. Now this is where I want us to pay attention. For CSTR and a PFR, we notice we've got rates in the denominator in both instances. So if we want to understand how to design CSTRs, what the volume is and what the volume is for a PBR, we're going to have to understand the nature of minus RA when it appears in the denominator. What does a function look like when we invert it? So let's take a look. Let me simply invert both sides of the equation. So 1 over minus RA is 1 over KCA0. <coughs> That's 1 minus X. So this isn't in your notes. So this is where, we, uh, this is where the example really is uh, that I handed out that we used earlier. So everyone's got a copy of this. Anyone else this, this <laughs> So let's, because this inverse appears in both these equations, we really do need to understand what this function looks like once we invert it. What is my left hand side going to look like when conversion is zero? It's going to be a constant value. 1 over KCA0. Okay, so where, where I'm going with this is the following. You can uh, see this in the plot in front of you. We're going to look at plotting conversion against 1 over 1 over R, uh, 1 over minus RA. We want to understand that how our system behaves at different levels of conversion. So at zero conversion, I'm going to get a point on my y-axis, the intercept, that's equal to 
1 over k c a 0. And I can easily find that point. I know k and I know c a 0. What's going to happen as x tends towards 100%? <coughs> So I want to get an idea for the two extremes at this point. What happens to the y-axis? Okay, minus 1 over r a goes to infinity. Another way of saying that is as x tends to 1, minus r a tends to 0. <coughs> Those two are equivalent statements. <coughs> does, that, does that make sense? Is this what we expect? Okay. It says as a reaction goes to completion, 100% completion, you're getting slower and slower. The rate of the reaction drops off. As you go more and more conversion, the rate at which you're converting drops off. Makes absolute sense, especially when we consider that minus Ra is Kca. As my reaction extends, it gets, gets greater and greater, so I'm going to 100% conversion. It's clear that Ca is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Until I get 100% reaction, Ca doesn't exist anymore. It's zero. My rate is zero. So we now have an idea of what the two extremes of this plot look like. At x equals 1, my, my plot is going to tend towards infinity. At the beginning, I'm going to hit a point on my y-axis towards 1 over kCa. So let's take a look now at the CSTR. So you've got this page in front of you. I would like you to use that plot and calculate what the volume of a CSTR is to achieve a certain conversion, a conversion of 80%. So let me explain what's, uh, what's there. The person has done a laboratory experiment and at different values of conversion, they've calculated what RA is. And so we don't need to know exactly how they've done this experiment. We'll talk about it in a few classes from now. But let's assume we've got this data available to us. So at zero conversion, my rate is 0.45 moles per meter cubed per second. At 0.1 conversion, I've got 0.37 and so forth. Of interest then is 1 over Ra, 1 over minus Ra. So this third row in the table is the inverse of the second row. There's also a fourth row here that's, that's just really helping us along. It's helping us because what we recognize is also, let's take a look at these two equations here side by side for a minute. Fa0 appears in the numerator and in the numerator. So what we've essentially plotted is or got here for us is FA0 divided by minus RA. So I'm going to emphasize that by putting, just rewriting this as follows. My design expression is FA0 times RA multiplied by conversion X. So it's the product of those two variables. I didn't really change anything. I'm just emphasizing that FA0 over minus RA is a useful value to calculate, and that's what's over here. My integral in the same way, I can write it as follows. I can actually bring FA0 into the integral. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. I can simply write FA0 over minus RA. So both these design equations rely on this ratio of FA0 over minus RA. Yes. FA0 is given to me. I know my molar flow. My system, this is a gas phase system, it's isothermal and constant pressure, so no change in volume. I don't know what my rate, my rate is. I have no idea if this is a first order, second order, third order system. But what I'm asking is from this data, calculate the volume of the CSTR required to achieve 80% conversion. So look at this equation, think about it for a few minutes, to try it on the plot. How do you calculate the volume of that CSTR required to get 80% conversion? Use 
are the design expressions that we've, that we've derived in this class. So they're up here on the, in red. Use these design expressions to calculate their volume to get 80% conversion. then go ahead and help them share your file. divided by minus RA at, at 8.0, uh, 0 0.8 I should say, um, at 0 0.8 conversion I've got 8.0 on my y axis. The product of 8 FA0 over RA multiplied by capital X is equal to the volume required. So that's from my CSTR equation. The product of these two terms gives me my volume of my CSTR. Geometrically, what is that doing on the plot? Geometrically, this is, represents an area. FA0 divided by minus RA represents the height along my y-axis. And x, I could also write this as a distance. I could also just simply write it as x minus 0. That's the distance along my x-axis from 0 to the desired conversion that I'm looking at. So you can visualize this as the area given by the orange hatch. So for a CSTR, if I have a plot of FA0 divided by minus RA on my y-axis, I have that data. That's easy to get from a laboratory. And I have conversion, I also get that from my lab experiment. I don't need to know if it's a first order, a second order, whatever order the system this is. This is a great way to design reactors from purely lab data without any knowledge of the kinetics and the, and the, and the details of the mechanism. Okay. Notice that your x-axis has no dimension, as, so it's unitless, I should say, it's dimensionless. x, unitless, y-axis, you can prove to yourself that the units are meters cubed. Whenever you're calculating the product of two variables, your x times y or area, remember from your integrals, when you do integrals geometrically, your units of the integral are equal to the units of your x multiplied by the units of your y. So the product of those gets you meters cubed, you get 6.4 meters cubed. So there's the solution for the CSTR, simply 
related to this shaded area. You pick the point of your conversion <coughs> and it's that shaded area. If I wanted to achieve a conversion of 0.6, it's this area. I go up to 0.6 and it's the total area given by that shaded region. Okay? So notice though, it's the, this total area. What's the PFR's size going to be? What's the volume of the PFR required to achieve 80% conversion? Half of it? Area under the curve. Roughly how much? 3.2? 2.0? 2. 2. something? 2.9? Okay, if you're stuck, <laughs> if you're stuck, you can calculate what the area of one of these little cubes are. So that's 0.2 times 2, so it's an area of each cube is about 0.4 meters cubed. We can sum up roughly how many of those cubes there are. Okay. So you can use your second plot for that. That's what the second plot is on your sheet in front of you. To calculate the area for the PFR, it's the integrated area between 0 and capital X. So I want to go from 0 conversion at my entrance to capital X conversion at the, at the outlet. So I can simply read off, um, I'm sorry, I can graphically integrate it here. But what's a better alternative? We don't know the integral, we don't know this option. Actually, this, this plot is probably not drawn quite accurately. We don't really know that black curve. All we really have are the data points in the table in, in front of you. So we don't really know that, that value. All we have are those, those dots on the, on the sheet. <coughs> so 3E. <coughs> Curve fitting is one option. Absolutely. You can fit a cubic a polynomial. What other methods did you learn? Trapezoid. Trapezoid is too easy. Which one is more accurate? Simpsons. Okay, so there you go. Let's use Simpson's rule. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be guaranteed in the exam. Okay, so if you need these, appendix A, you've got all the details in appendix A, or your good 3E notes from Tom Adams, or just use these two, I will help you out in many cases. Um, so the, please don't write this down. This is in the, this is on the website. Don't get this wrong because if you write this in the ball off the board incorrectly, um, I don't want you to mess up your exam. So here's the rule: if I put three equal space points, I can compute that using Simpson's rule. So I could use 0, 0.4, and 0.8, for example. Okay. Or slightly more accurately, I could go use back here. I've got three equally spaced points. I've got 0, 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. I can do it, that, use that first equation from 0 to 0 0.2, from 2 to 0.4. That's one. Those are three evenly spaced points. Then I can go add these other three evenly spaced points. So I can use that first uh, equation up there, the Simpsons 3 h rule, just twice, back to back. This is about the extent of the difficulty that you need for integration. So use either this formula if you've got three evenly spaced points or four evenly spaced points. I don't use the answer. Okay, so if I've just got this first formula, the first formula applies to three equally spaced points. Just go back to my original plot. I can apply it once between 0 and 0 0.4. So let's ignore this dot here at point 0.1. Okay. Just go from 0 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. There's my three evenly spaced points. Do that. Calculate this integral first. Then I can calculate this integral next. 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Can you just repeat that facing us, sir? I can't make it facing. Oh, no, no, you facing. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't see it. Okay, so 0 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. Okay, so there's your three evenly spaced points. Then you can go add the second region here, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, three evenly spaced points. And then there you sum them. Okay, so if you go do that, this you can write down. Um, I did it. You can double check my numbers at home.
Okay, so here you go. If you do it in the first one, so from 0, 0 0.4, you get the area of 0.55 meters cubed. Okay, so let's just pay attention here. If you integrate from 0 to 0 0.4, you would need a reactor of 0.55 meters cubed. You only wanted 40% conversion. So the integration from 0 to 0 0.4 gets me half a meter cubed. The integral from 0.4 to 0.8 adds on another 1.614. So that gets me a total area of 2.16. Okay, so for those of you that estimated roughly 2 meters cubed from the plot visually, you're, you're spot on. But please use these numerical techniques that we learned about three. Okay, so just uh, just let's compare this then finally. So there's C I see STR, there's my PFR. Um, I will post these to the website. You can obviously see why I didn't post these notes to the website, otherwise you would just answer the question right away. So here's, here's the comparison between the CSTR and PFR. The CSTR is all the shaded region, the PFR is only only that. So this this might you might lead you to think that, well, why are we even designing CSTRs? It looks like PFRs are always going to be smaller volume. Is that going to be true? Always? No. We're going to see very often that my curve does not always go monotonically up. If that happens, my curve goes monotonically up, for sure, PFR is always going to give me a smaller area than CSTR. CSTR is always going to be the bigger region. But for many rate curves, we're going to get, especially when we start taking non-isothermal behaviors into account, when systems operate adiabatically, we're going to start to see curves that do this. Okay. So if I wanted a conversion over here, the CSTR is that much area. Okay. Whereas the PFR would be far greater area. PFR, the integral is the integral totally under the region, and the PFR would have been all of this region. So in that instance, the PFR would be a bigger volume than the CSTR. Okay, so totally dependent on the kinetics. We cannot come up with general rules that says one reactor is better than the other. It's going to vary in every case. Now what gets really fun is the next part. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's put a CSTR first and then a PFR afterwards. We're going to put reactors in series. Okay. So we're going to say, well, let's maybe consider a CSTR up to this region, and then a PFR is going to continue the rest of the reaction for us to get to the conversion that we require. So what what we learn about this? Okay. So this example, um, we're going to see this in the tutorial again on Monday and Tuesday. But this is 